Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 3rd of September. Then this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 6th of September. And it's been another lacklustre week for European stocks. However, we still finished the month of August higher for the eighth month in a row with the FTSE 250 once again setting new record highs. This week's main focus, I think, has primarily been on the Friday or the, the August jobs report, which is due out later this afternoon, and which has seen expectations adjusted lower to some weaker than expected US economic data over the course of the past couple of weeks. I mean, this week, this week alone, we've seen ADP come in at around about 320 odd thousand, 325,000 for the second month in a row. Um, I needn't remind you that um, the July jobs report, ADP report, was similarly weak, and yet non farm payrolls came in at around about 940,000. So sometimes a weak ADP report doesn't necessarily translate into a weak non farms report. Nonetheless, expectations about this August report have been tempered somewhat. We're looking at around about 725, 750,000 for that particular number. But either way, I think that even if we get a miss on the July jobs report, I don't think we need to be overly concerned that um, US hiring trends aren't likely to pick up in the weeks and months ahead. Ultimately, a poor report won't change the likelihood of a tapering of asset purchases. It will affect the pace, it will affect the timing, and it will affect the scope of one, potentially pushing a taper into next year. Certainly, the US dollar has come under pressure over the course of the past week or so. We can certainly see it in these numbers here. Obviously, the Jackson Hole speech by Powell um, last week, um, I think really shifted the focus much more to the labour market than inflation expectations. Thinking, looking at the um, at the um, the inflation numbers, they are still quite hot, but they are starting to show signs of moderating slightly. The ISM manufacturing prices paid report fell back again for the second month in succession. However, we do have US PPI coming out next week in the coming week, and they still appear to be on an upward path. So there are there are supply chain supply chain concerns. There does appear to be starting we we do start to appear to be seeing um, upward pressure in wages in specific sectors. And I think the upcoming PPI numbers will be an added indicator as to whether these price pressures that we've been seeing over the course of the past three to four months are showing signs of abating or have further to go. Now, expectations for August PPI are for final demand to rise by 8.3% up from the 7.8% in July, with core prices rising 6.6% up from 6.2%. Now, you would think that that would be dollar positive, but actually it's been the it's been the actual reverse. Um, and I think there still is an expectation on the part of central bankers and markets in general, I think, that a slightly so, slower pace of US economic um, growth in the third quarter will push out the prospect of a Fed tapering to potentially the beginning of 2022. Um, that's not to say that we won't see increased sounds from the various hawks on the FOMC about bringing forward a taper to, say, for example, October. I think much of that will depend on the data. Certainly, the debate is ongoing. Um, and certainly, Robert Kaplan of the Dallas Fed showed no signs that he had resiled from his expectation that a taper would would start sooner rather than later. He would previously indicated that he might be persuaded to change his mind on the timing of a taper if the data continued to 
deteriorate or showed signs of deteriorating further. He's not at that stage yet. Um, so that I think really um, doesn't really call into question when the Fed will taper, it just calls into question the timing of it. And that's why the dollars slipped back. Um, the Fed meeting on the 22nd of September will be, I think, very, very key um, in the overall expectations of when a taper could come. But certainly, I think in terms of what we've seen over the past couple of weeks, the US dollar does appear to be um, on the cusp of a test of these lows down here, which is basically where the 50 week moving average is on the dollar index. It does appear that we could well see further short term dollar weakness. But overall, I can't get too bearish on the dollar, even if you take the view that um, EU inflation is now starting to pick up quite significantly. Earlier this week, we saw EU CPI hit 3%. Um, that was well above expectations and certainly I think makes it for a very interesting meeting next week of the European Central Bank. Um, but anyone who seems to think that somehow it means that the ECB will be look, looking to tighten monetary policy anytime soon, well, I've got a surprise for you, they won't be. Yeah, they might be additional debate about extending the PEP program, but the foot, you know, the, the ECB is likely to remain on hold well into the middle of this decade. Um, I can't I can't see a scenario um, at the moment which will cause the ECB to raise rates or push rates up um, from their currently negative levels. Um, so I think if we look back at the ECB rate meeting for this week, um, what we've seen over the course of the past few days as further euro strength. The big test, I think, for me with respect to the euro is going to be these peaks here of around about 119.10 and even higher around about 119.75. We've got a little bit of resistance coming through this channel line that I drew in through here from these peaks all the way back in January when we were up around about 122.80. Um, the middle of that channel um, is pretty much where we are at the moment. Um, a weak payrolls report could push the euro to the top of that channel um, and this 119.10 area. I would be very surprised if the payrolls report was so weak that it would push the euro up towards 120, but stranger things have happened. Um, but overall, I still very, I still remain very much of the opinion that um, euro dollar still remains very much um, sell the rally. Um, and certainly, I think if you look at a series of peaks through here, there's going to be quite a bit of a barrier um, to euro gains going through between 119 and 119.50. So, um, so that's euro dollar. Um, obviously, I think we also have to be cognizant of the fact that we have a German election at the end of this month. It's the 26th of September. I'll be writing about that uh, later this month. Um, but certainly, I think while there may be a sharper debate amongst ECB policymakers over a PEP extension, with the more hawkish members starting to make more noise about the potential for an extension from March 2022 to September 2022, until September 2022. I think for the time being, while the hawks may make the most noise, they still remain very much in the minority on the governing council. And while Christine Lagarde may not be able to get unanimity on any decision, um, she should still be able to get some form of majority when it comes to um, this week's decision on um, monetary policy. So that's um, the euro dollar ahead of the ECB rate meeting. If we have a quick look at euro sterling. We have continued to squeeze higher. This is a four hour chart, which is why it looks slightly different to previous ones. Now we can see very much the, the euro is in an uptrend at the moment. It's basically gaining on the back of the short squeeze that we've seen not only in euro dollar, but euro sterling more broadly, the slightly hotter than expected inflation numbers. But ultimately, for the same reason, I struggle to see upside in euro dollar. 
I struggle to see much upside in euro sterling either, um, simply because I think the Bank of England um, is going to be much more hawkish over the course of the next few months, data permitting. The appointment of Hugh Pill um, as chief economist to replace Andrew Haldane um, is likely to be a sop to the more hawkish members of, or, or to a more hawkish outlook, if you like, even though he will be reporting to Ben Broadbent, who, tends, who, is, who is one of the more dovish members. But certainly if you look at some of the previous commentary from Mr. Pill, he has been very critical of um, too loose monetary policy. So it'll be very interesting to see whether or not his pre-Bank of England scepticism lasts and continues when he joins the MPC. Um, I think an awful lot of people will be looking to see whether or not he's toned that criticism down um, when he takes up his post and starts commenting on matters of monetary policy going forward. Um, so in that context, we've got um, the latest UK industrial production and manufacturing production data on the 10th of September. We've also got monthly GDP numbers for July. And the July GDP numbers are likely to point to a continuation of the economic expansion that we saw in June, albeit at a slightly weaker level. If we look at cable, cable has lagged a little bit um, over the course of the past few um, weeks in terms of the rebound that we've seen in euro dollar. Again, this is another four hour chart, but we are very much in an uptrend. So I think even though on a longer term basis, we've come down from the highs that we saw all the way back in the 1st of June, we do appear to be starting to correct back up towards 139 and 140. Um, monthly GDP in June saw a gain of 1%. Um, certainly there is, no, and that was up from a 0.6% gain in May. For July, we're expected to see that moderate down from 1% to 0.8. But ultimately, um, while GDP growth is likely to slow on a three month basis, it still remains at a very healthy 3.8 to 4%. Despite weakness in um, industrial production and manufacturing production, and I think one of the one of the more head scratching elements of um, recent data when it comes to the UK economy has been the resilience of manufacturing and construction PMIs relative to the ONS industrial production and manufacturing data, which to all intents and purposes has been rubbish. It's been really, really poor. Um, but you have to basically look at it in the context of what the PMI data covers. PMIs don't cover the auto sector. And the auto sector has been struggling with production issues, um, chip shortages, worker shortages, and what have you. In July, UK car production slumped to its worst level since 1956, which suggests that this week's August manufacturing production numbers will be similarly disappointing. Various UK automakers have already announced production slowdowns due to shortages of important parts. So I think while we might not see um, the significant weakness in manufacturing industrial production we saw in July, it's likely to remain lacklustre um, when the August numbers are released. So um, you know, these, these, these supply chain shortages, these worker shortages are starting to affect economic output. It doesn't necessarily mean, uh, it's not for want of a lack of demand, it's for want of a lack of supply in terms of key components and key parts. So I'm not overly concerned about that because at some point these supply chain shortages will basically, the wrinkles will come out and suddenly you'll get a surge in production and that supply demand imbalance will correct itself. Um, so, so, th so those are those are the key those are the key items for the, the coming week. And, and as such, um, I really don't expect that to um, act as too significant a drag on the pound 
going forward. The economic figures, the outlook still looks fairly positive. Um, wage growth um, still looks fairly decent and is starting to pick up and there is a worker shortage. So um, unemployment, um, even with furlough running off, shouldn't, and I say shouldn't in inverted commas, um, jump up too significantly from the, the current levels that we have at the moment, though businesses might have to spend a bit more money in terms of retraining employees and what have you, but they should be doing that anyway. Um, in terms of wider economic data coming up over the course of the past, over the course of the next week or so, we've got the latest China trade numbers. Now, the Chinese economy, I think, is the one item that might cause a little bit of, might cause some reactions in financial markets and the stock markets in general, because there is growing evidence there that the economy is slowing down quite sharply. Um, part of it is self-inflicted in terms of a crackdown um, on key sectors of the economy. And uh, another part of it is obviously COVID-related disruption. Um, we've got China trade for August. We've seen over the course of the past few weeks, various disruptions at China's ports um, in the last month or so. That's likely to disrupt how much economic activity took place in August. We've seen lockdowns. We've seen Chinese exporters having to contend with supply chain bottlenecks, higher costs, component shortages, factory shutdowns, regional shutdowns. Um, and we've also got the fact that US demand is also slowing in the form of falling consumer confidence, um, which would suggest that this week's China trade numbers could introduce another downside surprise. I'll certainly be very, very surprised um, if we see a increase on the very impressive numbers that we saw in July. Um, recent data from Germany also showed that exports to China fell to a one-year low. So certainly in terms of trade, we're seeing slowdowns both from Germany and from the US into China. So that has got to be reflected or should be reflected in the China trade numbers going forward. So, you know, that really then beggars the question whether or not the People's Bank of China will step in to try and support the economy. Now, there's no evidence at the moment that um, they will be overly aggressive in doing that. They'll probably just do enough to keep the ship afloat, so to speak. So that is a risk going forward. And that's why we are still seeing the FTSE 100 continuing to struggle anywhere near 7,200. The one, I think, one, the one silver lining that we've got is that the, the lows are getting higher, which gives me um, some comfort that we could well um, continue to push higher. But it, it is glacial. And in, in some respects, it's like watching paint dry. But nonetheless, um, sometimes you have to be patient um, to um, before you actually hit the target that you're looking to see. So the, the FTSE 100, um, still looking fairly bullish. Um, the DAX is pretty much dull, as you can see from this chart here. We're not really seeing too much in the way of excitement there. Been trading in a fairly tight range. There's a decent top at around 16,000, but still finding fairly decent support in and around the 50-day moving average. Hopefully, um, when September starts in earnest, we'll start to see a little bit more, a little bit more volatility. But at the moment, um, markets are fairly quiet when it comes to the DAX. And we've also got the fact that the DAX will shortly in the next two or three weeks um, grow from 30 stocks to 40 stocks. Um, and the entry criteria for the DAX will change. Um, so that could well impact um, trading in Germany's benchmark index over the course of the next two to three weeks, as well as the fact that we have the small matter of a German election where it's unlikely to deliver a clear outcome. If um, I cast your mind back to 2017, it took um, the various parties in the German parliament over six months before they were able to form a government from the delivery of the, ex the election result uh, around about the, the, on the last Sunday in September, the new German government was finally sworn in 
on the 14th of March the following year, 14th of March 2018. So given the current state of the polls, we can look forward to seeing um, six months potentially of German political gridlock. Um, on the S&P 500, again, trend is your friend. Just follow the price action. We're continuing to push higher. This continues to be the key line in the sand in terms of dip buying for the S&P. And I think really the same applies to, say, for example, the NASDAQ 100, which has once again made new record highs here. And we can lob in the new line all the way through here for want of a better line, which also happens to coincide with the 50-day moving average. Let's get rid of that. Um, looking at um, the CMC Sterling Index, not really seeing too much to get excited about there. Let me just get rid of that because we don't need it anymore. Um, might draw in a new line for this. So a slightly different channel, just slightly redrawn it, um, rebounded off the lows here. Big question is whether or not we'll start to see a return back to these peaks that we saw back at the beginning of August. Um, other items to keep an eye out for in the upcoming weeks is there's two in particular that I've got my eye on. Um, first and foremost, we have GameStop, um, the old meme stock, the meme stock however you want to call it. Um, I think the big question here is really, do the fundamentals matter for a stock that's seen huge amounts of volatility since the middle of January? And, and for that, um, short interest has reduced markedly um, since the beginning of the year. Away from the noise that's dominated the discourse, I think, the, re I think the, the key thing around GameStop is whether or not new management can turn the business around. And I think the jury still remains out on that. Um, all the free publicity helped boost its Q1 numbers by 25% to $1.28 billion in revenues and cut its losses to 45 cents a share. But the company still faces an, a long road back. The company's bought itself more time. It sold an extra 5 million shares in June, raised another $1.1 billion in the process on top of the 550 million it raised in April. Now it needs to start making money, uh, even though, <laughs> you know, though even if it doesn't, um, that probably won't stop the shares from going higher again. Um, after all, I think down is the new up these days where memes, me, me, meme stops are concerned. Um, having said that, losses are expected to come in at 56 cents a share. Also worth keeping an eye out for, despite the fact that really the share price we're, not, we're probably not going to see much share price action in terms of Morrison's latest numbers, given the fact that it's basically, at, you know, in amongst a bidding war. Um, but it'll certainly give us an opportunity to look under the bonnet of the actual business itself. Um, you know, the UK's fourth largest supermarket, squeezed between the likes of Tesco's and Sainsbury's and the young upstarts of Aldi and Lidl. Now, there does appear, after an impressive Q1, to be increasing evidence that we're getting a little bit of a slowdown in Q2. And it's not surprising, you know, we've seen, we've seen the UK economy reopen, we've seen more and more people out and about. And while we could well have seen a pickup as a result of Euro 2020, the summer of sport and what have you, um, there is there is the likelihood that Q2 is likely to be um, see a significant slowdown to the impressive numbers that we saw in Q1. In Q1, total sales rose by 5.3%, with online sales showing an increase of 113%, while fuel sales were back to levels last seen pre-pandemic. So I think if we look at Q2, according to Kantar, in the 12 weeks to August, like the like sales for Morrison's were down 6.2% on 2020 levels. Now, obviously, you know, this, this is a different set of comparatives, but nonetheless, sales are still higher 
than they were pre-pandemic. And Morrison's market share is unchanged at 10.1%. So I don't really expect these first half numbers to really shift the share price one way or the other. But I think they could certainly pose the question for the two bidders as to whether or not what they're looking to pay for Morrison's is actually worth it if the Q2 numbers actually disappoint. So um, certainly something to keep an eye out for. Also releasing their latest numbers um, is Dunelm Group, full year numbers um, for 2021. They've they've been they've been an, an impressive performer um, as a result of the, the pandemic, and also Q2 numbers from Ted Baker. Um, so just quickly run through Brent crude. This is the daily chart here, looking to test the top of this channel here. This line's gone, so we can now remove it and now actually look at potential for further gains. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Crude oil prices are looking fairly well supported, but at the moment, um, I'm still not convinced of the case for them to go much above current levels, um, despite some of the wilder predictions out there. Gold, similar sort of story pretty toppy in and around here, around about 1,835, 1,840. A weak payrolls number could well um, push gold higher. A strong payrolls number could push it lower. It really is that binary. Okay, so that's it for this week. Um, hopefully, um, we'll get a bit more colour in the aftermath of this afternoon's payrolls report. Um, but in the meantime, have a great weekend, everybody, and um, see you all again, same time, same place, next week. Thanks very much for listening.